I think one of the things that's important is when you have a piece of land, you have to be a good steward of it. And uh, certainly, uh, I've tried to do my part here. Um, you know, one of the things that I see is that other neighbors around me are now interested in doing the same kind of work we're doing. Today we're in Reversburg, Pennsylvania in Center County, Miles Township. Uh, the name of the lodge is Pointer Haven Lodge. My wife and I purchased this property in 2005 and my interest was finding a piece of habitat that I could develop with switchgrass and other uh, upland habitat for training bird dogs. Um, I'm active with Pheasants Forever. I'm the local chapter president and have always had an interest in bird dogs since college. And right now I have uh, three German short hair pointers out here with us today, Lucy, Coco, and Oreo. And um, this is their playground. So that's what it started out as and then realized that uh, a lot of habitat work has gone on since 2005 and the kids have just arrived on cue. Uh, this is a very marginal piece of habitat. It has a lot of clay soils. It's very difficult. Most farmers wouldn't be interested in it because it's wet in the spring and dry in the summer. Uh, when we first bought the property, it was all the fields that you see behind me were covered with invasives. Uh, autumn olive, multiflower rose, pine trees, and others. It, it, the fields were trying to revert to forest, but my interest was to have a place where I could train bird dogs. So embarked with um, Dave Putnam years ago to, to eradicate some of the evasives and then uh, had a bunch of friends come in and assist me to remove all the different uh, things that uh, weren't really great for wildlife habitat and to upgrade it with uh, a lot of switchgrass on the property. We do have some food plots in the form of uh, sorghum, corn, and forage soybeans for deer and as well as the pheasants that we release here. The property is 109 acres. It ranges from a stream down in the lower part of the property to a hemlock forest that uh, has a lot of ravines that run through it. We have several drainages that come down off of Shriner Mountain that, trans that go through the property and we have cattails, we have alder thickets, we have a number of ha habitats in, in 109 acre property. Everything from upland to uh, a stream property to a deep forest up on the mountain uh, that is, is oak, hemlock, and maple. We do some trap shooting here. Uh, we have bird hunting obviously is an important part of what we do. Um, one of the things that my wife and I have uh, embarked on is we, we've now loaned our facility to several nonprofit groups as a way to fundraise. Um, Pheasants Forever utilized this this past winter at Pheasant Fest and um, they had a, a veterinarian by the uh, the lodge for the week for, for a donation. Uh, we also did it with a number of other nonprofits and we're going to be working with Pheasants Forever. It's called Women on the Wing, uh, a new program to get um, women involved in upland hunting. So I'm working with our one of our uh, national organization um, fundraisers and development officers uh, to bring that to fruition here. We also use it for a youth pheasant hunt every fall through our local chapter where we get anywhere from nine to 12 kids come out. We also team up with that event with the Wildlife Society, the Penn State University wildlife science majors. So we have a nice uh, combination there. And then in the spring, we team up with TU, Chesapeake Bay Foundation, Chesapeake Conservancy, uh, Pheasants Forever, Penn's, uh, Penn's Valley Conservation Association to bring all of the seventh grade students from Penn's Valley uh, who do trout in the classroom. Uh, after they come here and do a five station um, field day, uh, their next phase of the program is to go down to the Chesapeake Bay to see the interconnection between Elk Creek and the Chesapeake Bay and how one watershed affects the overall watershed of the Chesapeake Bay. Shortly after I bought the property uh, and we started the habitat improvements, uh, I was watching two does uh, most of the deer season only to come and find out a neighbor shot them across the creek on my side of the creek. Uh, left the evidence behind in form of a gut pile and then um, realized that the trespass laws in Pennsylvania really are, are kind of weak. You know, deer were on my side but he shot them anyway but what can you do? I wasn't there to see it. So all 
I had gotten a, a postcard in the mail from the Chesapeake Bay in, about buffers, and I thought, what a great way to do something for the stream, but also get it so thick down there that you couldn't see the deer on my side. So that was my impetus to uh, call Frank, uh, who sent the postcard from, uh, I guess Frank represents Clinton and Center County for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. And um, we've now been in the buffer about seven or eight years. Uh, we've revamped the buffer several times because we've learned a lot. One is deer like certain species of trees and uh, we've made some replantings and I think we were pretty close to the goal 75 percent uh, of the seedlings. We're, original planting was about 450. I think we're approaching 800 to 900 trees and tubes along the stream. We have some specimens that were from the first year but the vast majority of the stuff is segmented over the, the last eight years as we've replanted as trees have uh, been over browsed by deer. Um, we've learned that there's four species that the deer don't like. Sycamore, locust, uh, um, tulip poplar, and uh, we did put some um, some aspens in that seem the deer don't kind of favor also. But our oaks and, and the maples uh, were problematic and that the deer just browsed them as soon as they came out of the tube. So I'm really excited about the way this buffer looks today. Um, again, it was, it was planted in 2012, spring of 2012, and the first few years it was a little bit of a struggle. Um, we had heavy deer browsing pressure in here, we had some weed pressure in here, but again Chip uh, was very determined to make, the, make this a success and he continued to work on the weeds, the, the noxious weeds, the invasive weeds, he continued to replant. And so as I walk this today and look at it, uh, yeah, I'm just really excited. A lot of these trees now are coming out of these tubes. So when we first planted this, we were using four foot tree shelters um, and the trees would do well and then they would get to the four foot line and then the deer would just come and just browse them off, just browse them off year after year. So finally Chip took it upon himself to, to build some extensions onto these tubes. Now this is a five foot tube we're looking at here, but for the four footers, he, he put some extensions on. It was just enough to keep it out of the, out of the uh, reach of the deer. And so now we can see the silver maple is you know over six feet tall and out of this tube and a lot of the trees that we see here are also coming out of the tube so i really feel like this buffer is has really turned the corner a lot of native vegetation in here a lot of goldenrod um, bone set and different things like that and so that's well on its way to becoming a buffer well i've been lucky i've had some good friends to help out i have a, a nephew who uh, was going for his eagle scout project who adopted this and brought 15 scouts in uh, 2018 to, to replant about 350 trees. By also working with the local high school, there's a, a program called Mentors in Ag that we started through Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Uh, they bring 10 or 12 students out every spring to assist in the buffer planning. So pretty much every spring we uh, rehab it in the form of the ones that die. We replace them, recycle the tubes. Uh, so we keep the cost down to very minimal just for the seedlings. and uh, we'll have probably 700 trees fully developed here in the next couple years. Elk Creek is considered an impaired waterway while it is a class A trout stream. Uh, it has the impaired designation because we're in a heavily Amish area where there's a lot of agriculture, a lot of uh, grazing that takes place that allows the cattle into the stream. Uh, we had a lot of siltation in it so uh, we were fortunate enough to get a a grant through USDA and RCS in the form of um, seventy thousand dollars and then Chesapeake Bay threw in an additional fifteen thousand. We were able to put in about six hundred feet of mud sill to stabilize the bank, six rock veins, two hundred sections of random cluster boulders. Um, we've shrunk the stream in size in the form of the width to speed up the flow because this stream moved very slowly and since the previous owner had taken all the trees along the buffer out, and I'm trying to put them back, to shade the stream to cool down the, the water temperatures in the summer. Uh, we're already seeing uh, some real nice trout. I think uh, I've sent you a couple pictures of trout that inhabit this part of Elk Creek that any trout fisherman would be happy to uh, get a tight line with any one of these trout that have been caught in the stream and released, but it's uh, certainly the work that's been done uh, has improved the water quality and as a result of the activities here 
Uh, I've worked with an Amish neighbor as well as an English neighbor, and they now are in a grant cycle for some additional uh, nonprofit work, is some government work on the stream, and some feeder streams that come into Elk Creek. Um, and as a result, we're probably now protecting somewhere around 700 acres of the upland areas that feed into Elk Creek in the stretch uh, from, from Fox Gap Road uh, east uh, to Wolf Store Road. One of the things that we've seen in, in this stream is that uh, the water quality has improved because of the speed that we're sending the water through. With the six rock veins, we've been able to probably pull out on each of the rock veins with our high water events, we're collecting anywhere from a pickup truck to two pickup truck loads of silt in two years, since 2017 when the work was completed. The clarity of our waters improved, the areas where we would have natural reproduction of trout uh, as far as uh, rubble on the bottom has improved where we're not being constantly bombarded with the silt that comes downstream from the, the cattle grazing that is upstream of us. This project would not have been possible for a private landowner to accomplish without the partnerships that uh, other nonprofits, uh, governmental entities have brought to the table. First, I began with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, uh, en enrolled 3.1 acres in CREP. Uh, Partners for Wildlife came in through U.S. Fish and Wildlife. We removed probably 35 acres of invasive uh, autumn olive, barberry, multiflower rose for the upland work. Uh, as a result of my involvement with Partners for Wildlife and U.S. Fish and Wildlife and then Pheasants Forever, we found out about programs through the NRCS, which was, uh, we were able to get a grant for that, and that grant enabled us to do the stream work that a private landowner uh, doesn't have $70,000 to, to drop in a streamside program, uh, unless they're independently wealthy, which I'm not. I'm a retiree. Uh, living on a fixed income, but uh, I, I do believe that uh, just staying in the, by working with different groups, um, as a result of my involvement with uh, Partners for Wildlife, I went to a meeting, Chesapeake Conservancy made a presentation, they were looking for an area where they could do stream monitoring, uh, I offered my site here, uh, so they've been able to, for the last three years to monitor temperature, sediment, and nutrient level. Um, prior to and after the construction. So now we have good data as to what the stream was carrying in the form of uh, fish per acre or per section. Uh, we now electroshock pretty much every year. Um, one of the trout that uh, is probably going to be shown today is a, of a trout that was electroshocked that in a stream this size to be 21 and a half inches, four and a half pounds. Uh, he was boss hog for sure. And um, he certainly uh, has been eating well. The day that he was uh, electroshocked, he had four crayfish in his belly. So he, he, was, uh, he was the king of the manor here. We coordinate a project called Precision Conservation using the latest technology to identify places along streams where tree plantings are gonna intercept the most uh, pollutant laden runoff. And which that's especially important in this area, which is heavy with agriculture. We identified early in the process that Chip's property was a priority for installing streamside tree plantings and partners had already been working here uh, for a number of years to install different conservation practices. We've also been doing in-stream monitoring here um, after best management practices have been installed. We did monitoring before and then with those after results can see how the in-stream uh, habitat is changing and that's especially important. Uh, we found brook and brown trout in this section of Elk Creek um, before the project was done. And so what we're hoping here is that through the Chip Brown project, as well as some other projects that partners have lined up um, kind of next to this, that we'll see a big rebound in the trout populations and hopefully get some reproduction uh, of both brook and brown trout. Uh, as a result of our partnership with Chesapeake Conservancy, we did an electroshocking program for the Amish school that is just on the other hill here. And we had 50 children and about 10 or 12 uh, of the elders from the Amish community who might view things differently on the landscape than we do. But certainly conservation is one that should transcend both the Amish community and the English community as a landowner. Uh, it doesn't take much to, 
to start conservation, but it's, it's something that if we can just educate people as to the need to do it, I think uh, we'll all be better off in the long run. This looks great. Um, when we first completed the restoration, uh, we couldn't see our structures. It was dry enough for us to come in and install. It seemed like for about two years we couldn't see any of the structures because the water was up so much. It's nice to see that our structures are holding in place after the water's down. It's nice to see some of the rocks that we actually placed in there we didn't think we were ever going to see again. Um, it's nice to see habitat. It's nice to see a uh, stabilized stream bank. It's nice to see the buffer coming along. Uh, it's nice to see wildflowers. You know, all, all the stuff that wasn't here. It's, it's really, I have to go back and look at the pictures when we first got here to know, hey, these were vertical banks. There was no habitat here. The other thing it does, uh, our work does here with the partnership did here, it's reconnecting people to the stream. Before, if you wanted to come down and fish, you have to step off a five foot high drop. People didn't use the stream. People use the stream, they appreciate the stream. They appreciate what's going on with the stream. But other, some of the friends of mine that have fished the stream have, um, caught trout in the 18 to 16 inch class. What we're trying to develop is that spectrum of age groups from uh, fry up to the bigger trout that we already have. But with that habitat improvements that have taken place, we expect to see that in the next couple years. Like the canary in the mine, so to speak, uh, when I approached the teacher who did trout in the classroom, uh, tried to explain what we had done here at uh, Pointer Haven Lodge and how the kids could benefit by seeing the, what a healthy stream looks like. And the fact that uh, the water quality has improved. The kids last spring, or spring of 19 here, identified 47 different aquatic bugs that trout feed on. So that gave us the indicator that while we had great food sources, our work needed to be focused on habitat. And certainly the work that was done in 17 has proven that out, that we're now seeing more trout in the, in the stream of the 1,800 feet that was rehabbed. And the fortunate part about it is next year, uh, the, the downstream neighbors in the grant cycle to have his uh, 1,800 feet. So we'll nearly have protected or rehabbed three quarters of a mile of Elk Creek. Uh, but what we're trying to demonstrate here on the Pointer Haven property is that um, beyond just needing cold water, trout need a lot of other things. and the kind of habitat improvements that have taken place here on the property show that very vividly. And, and certainly the trout that was captured in electroshocking in front of the kids this year, when that 15 incher leaped out of the bucket he was being kept in, showed what a game fish is like as opposed to a, a, a trout that might have been hatchery raised. He had a lot of get up and go to launch himself out of the bucket uh, and trying to get back to the stream. When I first bought the property, I'm surrounded by an 1,800-acre sportsman's club known as Gravel Spring. Uh, they have, had enrolled in quality deer management. We practice quality deer management on our harvest of deer and does uh, on this property. Uh, so it is the number of deer uh, for the area has been controlled, but certainly we do see that we're getting some uh, older bucks in, in the harvest group that has been taken out here. And um, right now, one of the big things is um, the, the fact that uh, the deer population is balanced to, to what we can uh, maintain on the property. Um, the local club next door to me, uh, having that much acreage also does considerable food plot work. So uh, we're keeping the deer out of the farmer's fields, which makes the farmers around us happy and keeping them on these properties uh, where we can harvest them, but also manage them a little bit better than them raiding the, the farmer's crop fields. Yeah, so as a hunter, when I'm out looking for new deer hunting spots, I'm looking for places that attract deer and that hold deer, not just during hunting season, but throughout you know the whole year. And you know, as I walk around this property, I see a lot of things that attract and hold deer here. Uh, there's, there's hemlock groves for, for thermal cover in the wintertime. There's the fawning areas up where the warm season grass fields are. There's this this uh, young forest in here along the stream that uh, creates a nice travel corridor down through here and some cover and, and fawning habitat in here. Um, you know, the oak trees that are planted in here and the mature trees that are in here provide hard mast for the deer, the turkeys, bear, all kinds of game, and also non-game. So, yeah, I mean, 
it's a great property for deer and Chip and the folks that, that hunt here really have a lot of good options when it comes to placing a tree stand. Started on a Saturday morning looking at the real estate page. My wife was teaching at St. Francis and I uh, saw this property up for sale and came out and looked at it and uh, convinced my wife that this would be a good investment. Uh, she refers to it as my mistress, but uh, that's okay. I spent a lot of time out here developing habitat. Uh, I've had pointing dogs since college. And when I was at Penn State, we had a, a probably a, a very sustainable huntable population of, of wild pheasants in the center county area. Um, our pheasant population, our grouse population is almost next to nothing as compared to what it was in the 70s. Uh, if you own bird dogs, you're always looking for an opportunity to train your dogs and uh, the dogs have to point birds that are out there and so we supplement uh, their training with birds that uh, we stock on the property. And year after year, we're getting more and more, make it through the winter. Uh, we haven't had any nest yet on the property, but uh, we're not optimistic that that's ever gonna happen, but it's nice to see a rooster in June that was released in January, make it through at least that far. Uh, there's a lot of predators on the property with our game cameras. We catch bobcats, uh, fox, coyotes, and avian predators. I've, um, they do develop an affinity for a property like this, the avian predators. I've twice had avian predators. One took a chucker and another took a pheasant right in front of me uh, that, that was flushed. And it, that is as exciting to see as the opportunity to harvest the bird yourself. So we're not disappointed by the avian predators that are here, but uh, it's something you just have to live with. What we've done is having hunted in the Midwest where uh, switchgrass is king, where you have grass, you'll have pheasants. And uh, I normally hunt in the area of Emmitsburg, Iowa. And the public land out there is very good for the amount of uh, switchgrass that is on the, on the landscape. While uh, this is probably seven years now, we've been developing switchgrass that you see behind me. We have at least 15 acres of switchgrass. Uh, we have some upland thickets that are also, uh, we're developing some cattails. Most people don't want to see cattails, but to us, cattails are great winter cover for pheasants. Continuing with the, the switchgrass, uh, we just did seven additional acres this uh, late spring and early summer. Um, there's some alder thickets that we're expanding. Um, we do have woodcock that have frequented, certainly in the Elk Creek uh, flyway here. Uh, Oftentimes in the spring, we'll get woodcock doing the mating dance and whatnot here on the property. So it's a good woodcock habitat down near the stream. You need on the grants to get somebody to shepherd you through the maze. Certainly teaming up with nonprofits who know how to navigate that maze. Um, one of the things that we found is that uh, to apply for government program because we put this into a corporate entity because we allow people to hunt here. Um, and just wanted to have a little uh, financial protection for ourselves. Uh, the government paperwork is not easy, but certainly uh, teaming up with uh, folks like Frank or Adrian from the different uh, groups uh, has enabled us to get a lot more bang for the buck because the hours you spend filling out uh, grant proposals, oftentimes they shepherd you right through the process and it makes it so much easier. And there are plenty of grant opportunities out there. I think what we suffer from is people quickly get discouraged by the process that it takes. Um, it wasn't overnight that this took place. Uh, we started on some of the grant applications. It took three to four years to complete them. But at the end, it was certainly worth waiting and going through the process. I'd like it to be the way it is and, and not have it developed and turned into a farm again. Uh, but uh, certainly uh, I often think of some of the, the groups that are interested in a piece of property like that that uh, may look at arrangements. My wife and I don't have children, so certainly this uh, Pointer Haven property is something that we would look to maintain in a legacy for the future that the, the property be kept in the same way that we've in the last 12 years have maintained the property.